I'm very happy to welcome you here in Docs for an event which is part of the Prague Book World, which is both a book fair, but also now trying to be a real literary festival. And when I was as dramaturg of the book fair and literary festival, establish the general program, there's one event who came up to my mind almost immediately, one year ago, and it's tonight. And I also would like to thank very much two publishers which are here tonight, because when I spoke to them about Drago Yanchar and about Antonio and Lobo and Tunes, they agreed to make them translated into Czech, to make them available for the Czech readers, for you. And tonight, thanks to Plus and thanks to Garamond, you can read the latest version of the work of Drago Yanchar and Antonio Lobo Antunes. And I would like all of you to thank them. So, I will start with a very simple question. And I would like to start with the beginning. You both have something in common, is that you start writing quite young. If I remember correctly, you start writing at seven. Do you remember when you start writing and why you did start writing? And who would start, actually? <laughs> Thank you. I was never in such an unusual environment, uh, having a literary evening. And it's really exciting somehow. Uh, Yes, I start writing in school because uh, somehow uh, uh -huh, Close to the mouth. I realized very early that the only thing which can uh, help me in life was writing because I was bad in football, <laughs> I was very bad in mathematics, etc., etc. But when uh, professor of, my professor of Slovenian uh, in front of the, the whole class, was reading my texts for my school's texts. That was a kind of success, or a, that was a kind of substitute for all unsuccessful things in my life. <laughs> so uh, writing was Im immediately very important for me. And then, when I was a little older, uh, when I entered uh, Slovenian, a public, literary public life. It was a time of uh, Novo Roman in Slovenia. It was very popular there, Rob Grier, Natalie Saro, etc. And so my first book was uh, in style of this. Uh, and suddenly I, and I very early then realized that it is not my way of writing. I was bored a little bit with this, that, and I realized that I want to, li I want to write about life. Uh, which is always part of your experience, even if you write about the historical uh, problems. And so uh, it started, and it's still a uh, substitute replacement for my other personal uh, troubles in my life. <laughs> in literature, it works somehow. <laughs> and you, Antonio? Do you remember when you start writing and why? Start writing? Yeah. I, I think I start, I start writing at uh, six because of the necrological page of newspaper. <laughs> I mean it. I, uh, my grandfather, my mother's father had a house in where we go in summer near the Sierra and so on. And he spent all the time with newspaper laughing. So um, the newspaper arrived uh, by the train at 12 or something. I was five or six years old and me and one of my brothers went to the station to bring the newspaper home. And it was amazing because he opened that and he started laughing. <laughs> and he only looked at the necrological page. <laughs> And um, he was reading uh, for us and saying, 
He died at 60. So stupid. <laughs> <laughs> he died at 42. An idiot. <laughs> and laughed all the time. And uh, so that was very, he was a triumph, his triumph. And uh, for, for me, he was very funny because that was uh, such a funny thing that my grandfather, who never loved, loved all the time. So the first thing I wrote was, uh, so I started writing necrological news. And about my first one was about Donald Duck. And then Mickey Mouse. <laughs> so I make the necrological things. So I think I started that way, <laughs> writing the, because it's, I had the hope that my, all my grandfathers all over the world would start laughing, reading the death of Donald Duck and so on. I think it was like that. But it, it would be impossible nowadays because nobody is reading newspapers no more. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, 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 there's also something you, you mentioned the fact of writing because um, there's things you were, uh, you esteemed, you were not good at. And there's also something you have in common. You worked, or you studied, you studied law, you studied psych psychiatric, uh, Antonio. And it's completely different with writing. And you worked as psychiatric, for example, during many years. Can you repeat what, uh, what you're saying? You st you st use the headphones. No, no, no. It no. doesn't help. Okay. Um, Maybe we should change. No, no, that's okay. No, that's okay. You studied law and you studied psychoanalysis. You were a psychiatrist during many years. You were a doctor. The question is how so different kind of work was dealing with your own writing? Is being a writer and being someone completely different in your work normally is helping your, your writing or is okay? by saving yourself from the influence of being, for example, a journalist and a writer, or is, on the other hand, a challenge? Uh, so I studied law, but I never practiced it, because it was bored. <laughs> I was bored also with law, with, with, with this uh, all complicated uh, administrative and, and, and other things. And uh, I started as a, in a student newspaper as a, a kind of journalist or essayist, etc., and uh, immediately that was my my first con uh, conflict with the society. I was uh, I was editor of a student newspaper named Cathedra that was in Maribor University, and I wrote then and that was uh, in seventies. I wrote an uh, an article and uh, with a title for principles of pluralism. In that time, that was in communist times, uh, in Yugoslavia, and um, uh, I, I didn't think that we must change the, the regime. I just wanted to, to, to have more more oxygen, more more relaxed uh, relationship, etc. So this principle of uh, pluralism was for me, pluralism of different opinions, etc. But that was immediately at total scandal at the university. Um, uh, party members had their meetings, etc. And I was dismissed as a, as a, as a editor. And then immediately, uh, and a few months after this, also this student newspaper was, uh, was canceled. They didn't for, for, for two or three years was uh, not prohibited, but just it didn't work no more. So then I tried as a journalist also for a few years, and it didn't work again. And but then I had some serious, more serious troubles with the society. Uh, I've got in a jail for a, for a few months, and and there I realized that uh, there is something else and something much more important. That you must go deeper. You must open more existential questions about human being, about my own uh, views on the society, and not only the society, but the, but the indiv individual person, how it lives, uh, how he or she lives in, uh, in this society, etc. So, and I, I would then, I, that was time um, for um, 
a kind of escapism. And I wrote a historical novel about Inquisition uh, and so on. And, but everybody understood that I'm writing about the, uh, the society which is not free as it should be. Maybe I should add that uh, that was Yugoslavia at that time, which was much more open than Czech Republic or any other republic, Yugoslavia. We actually, we translated almost everything. Solzhenitsyn was translated and so on. But still, it was uh, when you touched the, the, the political problems, then you were immediately in troubles. So I wanted to go somewhere else, and that was literature. About this point, would you also agree about this point, but the, the point that Drago just made, the, the fact that actually literature is also trying to study the individual in front of the collective totalitarianism or social pressure. Is something you also think you're doing, Antonio? Is it something also like you're dinging into? The relationship between the individual and the society who put him in war, in, in exile, It's a question about your officer years yeah, and, yeah, and the yeah, revolution. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's easy to put questions from with difficulty are the answers. You know? um, sometimes I wonder, I only have questions, I don't have answers. So even, I think all the good books I like, so they are good because I like them. <laughs> they put questions, they don't give answers. And uh, I think that all my life I'm going to, to go on putting questions to me. Uh, anyway, I think it's after Donald Duck and all that, I understood that I couldn't live without that. Because perhaps I had a very special family, because um, in Portugal, you know, social levels are very definite. And they don't communicate between them. And, uh, well, uh, my family was, and uh, I was treated since I was a small boy as the future Viscount. And this was complicated for me because it put me aside from the other boys, you know? And uh, I was blonde with blue eyes, with lots of German blood and so on, in a country of dark people. Uh, it, uh, it was a little bit funny because uh, I felt myself different. And they, they never called me Antonio, it was you, the blonde. Between boys, eh? even when I played in Benfica, I played hockey. And um, my name was uh, Rus, which means blondes. I, uh, so I, I think I started writing because I was very lonely. I was very lonely. I, uh, so I, try, I started playing with words, and then I started discovering uh, amazing and strange things, because if you put them in a certain way, they could make sense. And I, I, I could start feeling that I had a place in the world. I was not only the son of my father, the grandson of my grandfather, I was I, and I could do what I wanted. This was felt in a contradictory way by my family. They, they, I mean, my father and so on, he read a lot. And it was it is splendid that there exist Mozart, but not in the family, you know? Writer, that's okay, marvelous, Flaubert and so on, but not in the family. In family, practical things. So uh, my father said to me, what do you want to study? And I said, uh, I, I want to go to work in a library sell books, because I could have lots of books. Huh? <laughs> and um, he was a very democratic man, and he said, uh, I think that's OK. That's OK, I agree with you. So you're going to medicine. <laughs> and so uh, with all that uh, democratic spirit, I found it was great. I went to medicine. I was 16 years old. And uh, I spent three years. I didn't go to the, to the university. I, stood at home writing and writing and writing, hoping that he would uh, allow me to, to write or to work in a library and so on. And um, 
Now my mother, who, who was a criminal, said, uh, made something very criminal. She said, uh, you know, I give you a car if you are well succeed in the, <laughs> in the university. So I thought, why not? I want a car, of course. And, uh, and it was great because I had a lot of girlfriends and so on. I was 17 or something. So I'm, I made <laughs> the studies and I had that and I could, I could write. I discovered it was much more easier to, to do the examination than to not go to them, you know? And so it was like that. I, uh, I didn't, I never thought about publishing. I, I, all I wanted was to write. And um, my father said to me, oh, you know, a writer is somebody who tells stories. And I said, no, it's not that. Mm -hmm. Stories are for grandmothers. I just want to write. I thought, do you want to say with this book? I, I, I have anything to say. I just want to write it. Hmm? I never, <clears throat> I never had, and never had any proposal or any intention, special intention. I just wanted to write, and so I started writing. Then I did medicine. Then I went to the war. Then I was wounded there. I lost the tear and so on, and. Um, that was a, an incredible experience because I learned there the existence of the others. The others didn't exist before the war. And suddenly I was an officer in war. And some of my boys, because soldiers were 20 years old, with the officers between 23 and 26. It was a kid's war. And suddenly I met death and everything and suffering and all that thing. We are not going to talk about that. It's too painful and not interesting. And uh, the fact that I lost so many things there, you know, it was 27 months of war, war, war in Africa, war, 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 and dictatorship here. I accepted to go there because there were lots of boys who ran away and went to France and so on, to Paris and to make the revolutions in Paris cafes. In fact, they were afraid. I was very much afraid. <laughs> and, um, and I thought, if I go there, I, I, I never could, I never will be able to return to Portugal because dictatorship started in 26 and it finished in 74 with the revolution, made by my comrades. I was in Africa between 71 and 73. The dictatorship go on, went on. So I thought, if I don't go there, I don't want to go to Paris to, to read Sartre and so on, and all that authors don't mean nothing to me. I, I want to be here and I want to write. So I went to the war and I, I couldn't publish anything, of course, because the political police was always picking up the books and so on. And they went to the libraries and books. One day they went to the library and um, took up Racine, uh, uh, Racine, Racine, and Lenin, uh, and Lenin too. Everything who finished in in, <laughs> because the censorship was very stupid. Political policy was very stupid. But we, uh, we were very much afraid. I remember one of my brothers, we are six brothers, uh, we are dining at my parents' house and he asked my father a very difficult question, Dad, what's democracy? And it was a silence, my father was in silence because we had servants. They could tell to the political police. And my father said to him, shut up and eat. You couldn't speak anything about politics, anything you were afraid of. Because the political police was very uh, present, there were concentration camps, there were prisons, yum, 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 yum. So I couldn't publish anything. And uh, the idea of publish I, was not in my mind, so I go on working. And then when I returned, it was very difficult to adapt myself to, to life in Portugal, in Europe. And. Uh, I because I, I continue to dream about Africa. And during this, I was writing the one book who appeared last year, 
And my wife was telling that sometimes I wake up screaming and asking, give me my gun, and so on and so on and so on. I don't remember that. But it stays inside you forever. And I have scares. Okay. I have scares. I was blessed. And uh, so I go on working. And then the, the movement of the young officers started. I could uh, uh, be with them because I was, they were with me in Africa, or I were with them. So I, I could be a little part of that. And after that, suddenly it was liberty. It was like that. And I thought, now I can publish one day. OK. Is it something you also experienced, Drago? Because in the beginning, when you, when you were writing, it was also difficult for you to be published in published. Yeah. Uh, and actually, you were also part of, you, you, you didn't leave the country. You were also engaged politically. And after when there was the, the break of uh, Yugoslavia, did you also discover the other, like being a Slovan in front of the Croatian? Yes. Uh, when I, we were in taxi together, and I already heard how uh, hard was censorship in, in, uh, in uh, in Portugal and uh, colonies also probably, but it was never so uh, far in Yugoslavia. Uh, it, the censorship was not so strong. Uh, we, uh, Yugoslavia was quite open in, because we had the open borders after 67 or something, and it was very different from the other countries in uh, uh, so-called Eastern Bloc, so we could travel what was very important, and uh, we could also read because uh, everything which, what was, that was a time when the so-called socialistic uh, realism was in decline, and modernism was coming out, etc. And we could read actually uh, uh, everything. So literature was quite free. Uh, theater was quite free. We, we played uh, all, uh, uh, played of, of Sartre, of, uh, in, on, on the eastern part of the world, the f uh, forbidden authors, etc. Then the, the, in the film, there was already a little more complicated. <laughs> but uh, in uh, journalism, in newspapers, and every uh, attempt to establish some kind of political opposition, there was something like <laughs> We can say censorship. It was a, that was the end of the story. So uh, literature was always was very often, and the theater also was very often some kind of a, of a way for for freedom thinking, etc. And I always remember, I always think about uh, how, for instance. If you if if they play uh, Macbeth in uh, in uh, in, uh, in uh, England or in Britain, it was always the story about there are bloody kings fighting for for uh, for uh, for uh, for, uh, for power etc. But if you play the same the same Shakespeare in uh, in uh, somewhere in Eastern Europe, that was a story about their uh, uh, contemporary bloody kings, you know. And so in the theater and, and in the literature, it was always some, some, something else. And this is why literature, also theater, from time to time was so popular. People were reading. Uh, books were very often attacked by central committee, ideological com uh, groups, etc. But so that, that was a kind of a, 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 a freedom and possibility to escape in more freedom world. So, Except that years after my conflict with uh, with with the court and the uh, and the regime, uh, then I uh, later could publish. So I was I published a lot also in socialistic times. So it was not so tough uh, like in Eastern Europe or even uh, or, or or like in Portugal or, or other dictatorships. That was a tricky way to people convinced that socialism has also on this field, except that brotherhood and uh, that we are all equal, etc., uh, that on this field has uh, a kind of freedom and possibility. That was Yugoslavia was quite different uh, in this way. But 
Yugoslavia in a political way remained to the, to the end of dictatorship. And this is the reason why uh, this quite wonderful country with uh, a variety of, uh, of languages, cultures, etc., was dismantled. <laughs> Actually, there's one question I would like to speak most precisely about literature and letters of books. And your two books, each of them, are actually about historical movement. Historical moment. Uh, you, Drago, is about the troubles of the uh, right after the uh, Second World War and um, the rise of Tito. And uh, you, Antonio, uh, it's about the, the return after the the, um, the end of colonialism in Angola, when people came back. And actually, you, both of you are doing something. Uh, you never follow just one person precisely. There's also always many characters. In, in your book, there's five people looking for one person. And in your book, there's a lot of various migrants coming back, uh, which are named um, after the names of the greatest hero and explorers of, of Portugal. Is it because it's not possible to speak about history with just one angle? Or is it just because it's better to have many characters because you can write more about them? We again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh... I had no, I had no uh, intention to uh, to change the society or to enter in the social problems with this book. I was just touched. I was shocked when I learned about one story which happened uh, in the last year of the war in Slovenia, in a tor turmoil of a, of a, of a different uh, armies which were fighting there. Uh, Slovenia was occupied by, by Germans and in first uh, first time first three times of the war also by Italians, and that was a uh, partisan movement uh, uh, struggle against occup occupation, etc. But in, in the middle there were people who wanted just wanted to leave. That some as say some hero of my novel, and that was that was a woman. That was an extravagant woman, a little extravagant from from bourgeois, from Slovenian uh, or Ljubljana bourgeoisie, they were rich people, etc. And uh, she just wanted to remain as she was before. But it was in this time, it was not possible to live as before. And suddenly she is in a conflict with uh, in political, military, uh, police, everything, every conflict which was happening at that time in in my country, and uh, th that was for me was just a question. I was emotionally somehow or, or uh, somehow touched with this uh, with this story, which I learned from one chronicle, uh, one one uh, historical chronicle about one mansion in Upper Carniola. And I was just looking for the way how to tell the story. I didn't want to make a psychological portrait of this woman, etc. I decided that they, the other people who speak about her, they all speak about her. Every story is about her. And slow by slow, grow, there is, they grow uh, her personality, her behaving, her... Uh, very individual uh, and original personality. And that was the way how I, how I wanted to say. But of course, behind is also history, politics, war, everything. But in the center is actually a kind of romantic and, and, and love story, which ended as is ended. <laughs> as all of sorry. I mean, you know, it, it's it's funny to to be <laughs> that the French put me questions in English. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, uh, when I, I st the, my story is very simple. I was in school, and in school you must learn history, and you have those books. 
with their uh, photograph, their, their image of the conquerors, navigators, the kings, and so on. I was six years old, as the other boy, six, seven, eight. What did you do? With the pencil or with the pen, we put moustache and glasses and uh, hair, and uh, we transformed them. So I spent uh, all those years transforming the uh, Portugal heroes. Portugal, very proud from their past, like all widows. In a sense, Portugal is a kind of a widow, <laughs> crying for his, uh, his uh, dead husband or something, which whom they had, she had, she, the country, had um, a very contradictory relation. Our relations are contradictory anyway, happily. Uh, so I start making moustaches and glasses and so on and all that people, dressing them in a different way. Uh, it was very funny, not for the professor. <laughs> and uh, it, it's very hard to find a professor with a sense of humor. <laughs> when they have sense of humor, they don't want to, to teach anything to anybody. They don't want to learn. <laughs> and professors don't want to learn. They want to teach. I love them. And um, so I started like that. So in that book, is a little bit like that. I'm making moustache and glasses and so on in the, all those heroes. Uh, those navigators, those priests, those... Um, who was presented to you as the examples of you must be. Mm. And in reality, all the, those navigations were very painful and very killing everybody. <clears throat> it, it was very funny that, uh, that the, the idea of death in the medieval times and the idea of death of the professor or teachers now in modern times. So I, I start writing that, uh, that book is a little bit that. It's an old book. It, uh, now they make, uh, uh, some weeks ago, uh, a very great big edition of that book because it made 30 years that they were, it was published. I was very young when I wrote that. And uh, it was that I want to, a little bit to dismystify, if I can say like that, the greatest Portugal grandeur and so on and so on and so on. Who doesn't mean anything to me, doesn't mean anything because people are poor, living badly. Most of the people in Portugal, they don't live well. And um, I think uh, there are a part in me who will feel eternally uh, guilty to be born in family where I was born, to be raised the way I was raised, for example, my first communion, I was born in Lisbon. Not in Lisbon, in Italy, of course. In St. Anthony Church in Padova. All my life has been like that. So um, I always felt guilty about that. Always felt guilty. And so it's kind of a um, jugement de compte. You see? I don't know how to say it in English. Uh, about that past. I will not try. <laughs> about that grandeur. <laughs> about because finally they were like everybody. They were, they were going to die like dogs. Because everybody, in general, people die like dogs. It's very difficult to find uh, a man or a woman. Women are much more brave than us. Much more. I had a cancer some years ago. And I had to do um, uh, first surgery, then chemotherapy, the big room with 50 persons, men, women, and so on, like that, during four or five hours. I didn't know if I, I, didn't know if I was going to die or not die or be cured or not be cured. And I didn't know too. And uh, for me it was very important because people were so brave, so courageous, always a smile. And uh, mainly women. Women were incredible. I, um, I think I always respected women. Now I respect them much more because they live that with the courage, a serenity, and even with a joy sometimes. I will never forget that. I, and then I, th then, then I understood 
shit, I'm here between princes, between kings and queens. These are the, the true aristocracy of my country, or of all countries, are the people who face suffering with dignity and who died with lots of dignity. So I thought, shit, I must write things that who, who can be so, so important as they are, because they are all of them much better than me. I was afraid, of course. I didn't want to die. I didn't know what was going to happen, but a, a cancer in each lung six years ago. And then I was curious, but it was very painful. Lots of symptoms. I was talking about it, I don't know why. I'm stupid. I'm... But um, anyway, I associated that with writing. Because in a way, <clears throat> what's writing? Yeah, sometimes I wonder, because it's my life. I start writing at 7 in the morning until 11 night when I'm with the book. Now I'm with the book. And uh, here I can't do anything. And uh, I respect very much writers. And I respect very much readers because they, they read us. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a miracle. You, you, you do that and people go and read it. Yeah? And you're translated <laughs> everywhere and so on. The day before I came, I received my agency call to say, now we are going to be translated in all our countries. Oh, uh. <laughs> 240 million more readers. <laughs> this is very strange. You don't deserve that. But um, readers are very, very, have been very generous to me. And uh, so I'm very happy with that. And I don't remember what was your question. It's OK. <laughs> Actually, you start. You start, actually, it's perfect. You start by pointing out that it was strange to be asked by a French guy in English. And then you, you say that it was strange for you to be asked in English by a French guy. And you finish by mentioning your readers. And hopefully we have readers here, and they are not all French, I expect. So maybe we could ask some of them to ask you, and to Drago also, some questions. If there's any question, French are forbidden. <laughs> no. It's great, we can go. Můžu jednu otázku na Draga Jančara. Uh, okay, one question for Drago Jančar. Uh, you were talking about... <laughs> Uh, about the uh, lack of freedom in the 70s. And I was uh, w watching a document about Marco Brezel, uh, who's, uh, who was uh, a rock star in 1970s. And he said, show me the person who says there was no freedom in Yugoslavia in the 70s. So how can you see the, uh, the, this time so differently? I, I don't agree. I, does this, I must really say that I disagree with him because exactly seventies were, the, were were the problem uh, in Yugoslavia. We called them svinčena leta, kako se reče, svinčena leta, plan beers, plan beers, because. It was Tito was uh, already very ill, and it was uh, like uh, again in some Shakespeare uh, piece there was uh, fighting for power behind uh, his uh, around his uh, his bed in his hospital. It was a little before, and then uh, then was in Yugoslavia was in. Uh, I'm talking now politically because Yugoslavia, the, the beginning of the 70s, it was so called wave of liberalism, something similar to what, what happened in Czech, uh, Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia at that time with Dubček, etc. Uh, we have a very strong, uh, strong group of uh, younger communist politicians who wanted to 
to uh, to make a free market, to to a little more uh, uh, free newspapers, media, etc., etc. But they didn't succeed because the tough guys from Communist Party stopped them. It was fortunately not the same like happened here with the invasion of uh, of uh, Soviet troops and other troops from Eastern Bloc. But uh, in, in the meetings, uh, long night meetings of the Central Committee that we were listening, <laughs> uh, it was clear that this wave will be, will be it will be over, it will, it will collapse, and it's happened. And 70s were really tough, and then in, uh, at the beginning of 80s, they, these years were really free. That was, a, that was an explosion of new media, of uh, young people, of punk, uh, uh, homoerotic <laughs> opening about homosexuality. All the questions were more and more open. So 80s, when we were uh, approaching, uh, again, unfortunate 90s, it was that there was, was really uh, good times. I have good memories for these times. I was member of, a, of, let's say, oppositional newspaper, which was allowed in that time. Novare Via, group of intellectuals in Ljubljana. We have uh, vivid debates, long night debates, etc. So I disagree about 70s, but 80s were really free in Yugoslavia and Slovenia, but all happy years. <laughs> Uh, have sometimes unfortunate ending, and it happened with the terrible war in Yugoslavia. And I must repeat again, it, it didn't happen because some tribes were fighting there because they are different religions and tribes and with tribal mentality, etc. It was because Yugoslavia was not ready to get out of dictatorship, and that was the problem. Otherwise, maybe we would find some way of some confederation, etc. Maybe, I don't know now, it's uh, easy to speak now, but nobody expected that such a terrible war will, will come out after, after this, let's say, quite happy 80s. Uh, one question. question. Uh, now, how do you explain the situations, this absurd? The same question. Maybe the continue. It's for you. The absurd of Yugoslavia. Absurd. Yeah, it is. Absurd of Yugoslavia. Yeah, because the. It's work, yeah. Why they are not in Unia? European. Why, 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 that, that, why Yugoslavia not why exist? Why they no are not in this? They are not member. In Union? Yeah. In the European Union? Yeah. Slovenia is a member from yes, the Yes, I, I very think the, the, the Yugoslavia that is a part of many different countries, yes. many different cultures, Maybe many you, different peoples. Maybe you should ask somebody from the European <laughs> no, Union. From European I, I'm Commission. asking for your opinion. But as far as I know, there are consequences of the war, which, which with this war in Yugoslavia was in some part of Yugoslavia was more terrible than the war in uh, the, the World War II, especially in Bosnia in, and in parts of Croatia and then Kosovo, etc. And uh, after all these new states were established. Uh, uh, circumstances in these different states were, were, were simply full of, uh, of uh, remains of, the, of this war. And, uh, and from the point of uh, European bureaucrats, they were not ready. And as far as I know, uh, uh, as far as I know, they are now approaching all of them, Serbia, Montenegro, uh, Kosovo, etc. So suddenly, there are eight new states there, <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's a big problem. But my hope is it, and I believe that it will happen. And 
uh, it will be very useful for all these states that when they will become uh, members of union because standards of European Union are tougher and better than many politicians there uh, imagine. And it will be good for uh, new pers perspe perspectives for, for, for the whole area. But sorry, I'm not a politician, and this is just my personal opinions. And why are they not? This is the reason. For your opinion, like a, like a writer. Not like a politics, like a writer. Super, so he actually... Yeah. Yeah. You asking me, you asking. As a writer, I would, I would be happy if, we were, if the world would be happier as it is, that the, the, the war wouldn't happen there. But I was in, uh, during the war, I was in a group of writers of uh, uh, International Pen Center, we were sent, or actually we, we weren't sent, we decided to go in Sarajevo when it was sieged by by, uh, by uh, army of uh, Serbian army. In, uh, in, in, and this, that was interesting uh, when they s speak how they hate each other, etc. In Sarajevo, they didn't speak that this is Serbian army on the, on the hills around the city, and they say, these people there, these people, they didn't want to go uh, deeper. So I was for a week there and I experienced a little of, uh, of a war, not, not so much as uh, at Tunis in Angola, but I saw uh, what the war is and what the consequences it, and, and I would never, never like uh, in a, uh, our happy years, as I said before, in the 80s, that something like this would happen. Yes, and I am a writer, but I am very often should to speak about the politics. I will tell you some anecdote, anecdote from uh, the beginning of 90s, when uh, first of my book, uh, The Galley Slave, was translated in German, and uh, it was in Frankfurt, uh, and on the stand of this publisher, who published also some writers from different parts of Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia, and my books were there, beautiful covers, my first book in German, and I had prepared many, I had prepared many good answers for eventual questions of journalists, etc. And the, all the day, there were cameras and microphones on our stand, etc. And all the day, we were uh, answering political questions about the war, about the TDs, about the socialists, about the communism, etc. And it was six o'clock in the in the evening, and uh, people were leaving already. They were packing their books and stands, etc. And one journalist from Munich Radio came to me, and uh, for for the interview, and I said to her, "Dear lady." Look at this book, so beautiful book. I have so many good answers prepared for this. Would you ask me something about this book? And she said, oh yes. And please answer, tell, tell me something about this book. And I, was, I spoke about five minutes or something. And her next, next question was, do you think that Slovenia started the war in Yugoslavia? <laughs> Well, we have time just for one last question, but please, as Drago said, not a political one. Let's ask about literature. It could be political. I would prefer literature. <laughs> uh, hello. Uh, my question is, uh, at the beginning of this session, you spoke about how you got into writing, what was your first motivation, and especially Antonio said that he just wanted to write. Uh, now that you are accomplished writers, what keeps you going? What is your motivation to carry on and not just to lay back and enjoy the sun? <laughs> uh, Français. 
pour devenir un écrivain. Et maintenant que tu es devenu un écrivain accompli, qu'est-ce qui te fait continuer à écrire Mais la réponse en anglais. Yeah, you're making very personal questions. <laughs> And if I answer you, it could be a scene or something or a scandal. I don't know. I, I, I think that, um, you know, I, I don't conceive my life without that. And it's my, it's my reason. I'm, uh, when I was in New York, <clears throat> There was there a woman that uh, admired profoundly, because Professor Margaret Mahler. She was a niece, a niece of the compositor. She was a lady, she was 85 years old or something, dressed in rose, pink rose, and uh, drinking vodka in her apartment. One of my brothers was a brain surgeon there, had operated her because she had a problem, she couldn't move. And after that, she was curious. And uh, it was maybe the most clever and intelligent woman that I met in my life. I loved her, very tall. She always had pupils, young musicians, uh, living at her house. Your wife is listening. Pardon? Take care, your wife is listening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, once she said me uh, a phrase that I will never forget. Uh, I, I was there, I was, I have, it was at the time that the first book appeared in New York. And she said to me, she, she, she dressed in shocking pink. Uh, You are magnificently unprepared for the long littleness of life. <laughs> This is the most extraordinary sentence I, I ever heard in my life from that Czech woman. I want to repeat that, it's so beautiful. You are magnificently unprepared for the long littleness of life. And she was absolutely right. We are all of them unprepared for the long littleness of life. So maybe that's the reason I go on writing, to try to be a little more prepared for that long littleness. Because at the same time, she always had the musicians. <clears throat> And uh, at that time, it was a, a girl who was a, pie, a pianista, pianist. And she was very beautiful. I invited her to go to 54, the famous discotheque in, in uh, New York. And Professor Mahler, said to me, if I was younger, I would seduce you. <laughs> and I said, you already did it, Professor. But she, she was not happy at that, with that answer at all. So, 85 years old, um, a disease who almost destroyed her, the death of her husband, and so on. And she was there struggling and fighting for her patient. She was one of two greatest women in the story of psychiatry of the 20th century. She transformed it. She transformed the, she understood finally the rule of the father in the first two months of life. She has a, a work, a unique and extraordinary work. And she was generous, she was such an appetite of life. If I was younger, I would say this is beautiful. And she was very much sincere. And I thought, well, I, uh, I must go on writing. See, uh, death will never destroy this woman. Time will never destroy this woman or her work. And uh, I loved her and I respect her so much. So that's, I think that's the reason why us poor us go on writing. To, to talk for the people who can talk, you know? To, to speak about things that if we don't speak about them, they, they will be forgotten. And it's not in vain that uh, writers everywhere have been prosecuted everywhere. Uh, in 
his country in mind during the dictatorships. It was they were violently treated. We had concentration camps, we had prisons, we had everything. It was not easy to, to write. Write is very dangerous. Remember Ovidius went to die at um, <clears throat> Romania and he was very lucky. So it's a dangerous profession, but uh, you can't um, imagine all your life without that. As I couldn't imagine the life of Professor Muller without understanding people. Thank you. Thanks you, thank you all of you for being here. Thanks the two of you for having sharing this very interesting thought, especially that stories are for grandmas, and that the path of democracy is paved with punks and homo pornography. <laughs> I would like now to invite all of you, uh, maybe for having a glass of wine or something like that. You can buy the books make it sign, and through the books be a bit more prepared for the life. Thanks a lot.